Hello and welcome to week 12 of Communication Conflict Resolution. As always, I'm your instructor, Michael Betker, and this week we're going to wrap up on our module number five on emotions. That's, of course, my contact information in there, so you can't miss me. 262-490-7493 is my phone number. You can text me there as well, or you can email me, which is probably the best way to do that, betkerm at uww.edu. Or if you're so, so inclined, you can meet me face-to-face -face on, uh, on Mondays and Wednesdays from 2 to 4.30. So here's what we've got going on this week here. Again, we're like I said, we're wrapping up on emotions this week. Uh, 65 total points in the form of a reading quiz number nine worth 25 points and a thought piece number four worth 40 points. So the first thing you want to do is obviously watch this lecture video, which if you're hearing my voice now, you, you're on your way. Um, I'd also like you to read the anatomy of an emotional hijacking um, article, which is uh, obviously tucked in the first piece of this section. And there's a short video as well I'd like you to watch entitled The Amygdala in Five Minutes, where one of the persons are mentioned in the article breaks it down, breaks down the basics of the amygdala, which is really responsible for uh, what happens when we make this, what's known as a fight or flight response in our brains. So we'll talk about that in this lecture as well. And then, of course, I'd like you to also take this emotional intelligence quiz, which is a really shorthand version of something you can take, which is a lot longer. But this is just 10 questions to give you a quick idea, a quick snapshot of your own emotional, emotional intelligence. And then we'll talk about how that kind of relates to everything we're talking about here. But really, awareness of your emotional sort of triggers is, is the goal here. And that's something I want to mention, too, emotional intelligence, unlike IQ, which is largely sort of... Uh, hardwired. Now we can get smarter over time, but it's more hardwired. Emotional intelligence is something you can actually uh, learn and improve with. So we'll talk about that as well. So that's this week. Let's press on here. Uh, chapter nine, like I said, or reading quiz number nine rather is worth 25 points. It's open book and 45 minutes you'll have to take it. Uh, here is the snapshot of what it looks like to go to. The, the link is provided, so you just got to go in there and find it and then take this quick test here. And then kind of make, make note of your score, I would say. Write that down somewhere because it's going to inform this thought piece, which is thought piece number four, in which conflict is inevitable, is what we've, we've been discussing in this course the whole semester. So really what I want you to do is obviously write a mindful sort of thought piece about yourself and what you've learned so far in this class. In fact, I'd like you to pick three things, three concepts, ideas, attitudes, or strategies that you've uncovered or learned about from this class. Uh, and write about those. Starting off, though, I'd like you to start talking about your emotional intelligence quiz score uh, using that link provided, and really take a, a quick reflection on that. Uh, was the score higher or lower than you expected? And um, and you know, really, really start off by talking about kind of your your thoughts, your initial thoughts on your emotional intelligence quiz results, and then of course launching into uh, your three learnings uh, that you'd like to talk about as a way of improving yourself. Obviously, it's a page and a half. 500 to 600 words, and you want to make sure your writing is, is skillful. In other words, watch your spelling, your grammar, and your sentence structure. Okay, so let's let's talk about the article a bit here. And Anatomy of an uh, Emotional Hijacking is really a pretty cool article because it talks about the physiological uh, underpinnings of what happens when we have an emotional response to something. So toward that end, August 28th, 1963, the article starts talking about that as an important day, not just because MLK gave his great speech, I Have a Dream, um, but also because something known as the career girl murders happened. Now, so I'll quickly explain that. You can read the article as well, but I'll give you a quick down and dirty on that. A guy by the name of Richard Robles, in that same day, at the same time, who was a seasoned burglar, who made his money basically to support a heroin addict, or he, he was a heroin addict, so he supported his heroin habit, rather, um, stumbled into a rich neighborhood. We thought, obviously, he was going in not thinking there'd be anybody there, and he encountered um, Janice Wiley. So Janice was there, and obviously he was forced to kind of point, point a knife at her and, and, uh, and tie her up. And during the course of that interaction, her roommate, Emily Hoffert, came home, who was a, a grade school teacher. And what happened then, of course, was uh, 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 the situation I want to talk about. So he, he tied them up and was about to leave, and one of the ladies... Uh, basically said that we're gonna, you know, you're gonna get caught. You're, we're, you're gonna be found. I saw your face, and he kind of went bananas to his own mind. And they interviewed him years after because he's still in jail, obviously for this murder, these murders. But um, he he just snapped basically, and this is what we're gonna talk about here. But we have we all have this uh, same reaction in in various ways. Now garden variety versions of this, obviously, most of us thankfully are not. Um, um, 
not building a life of crime necessarily, but we still all have this basic response within us. And it's an emotional one uh, that obviously leads sometimes to bad things. So we'll talk more about this, but that was it. So we have what's known as the amygdala. And that's really what the lion's share of this discussion is going to be about today. The amygdala is a small little walnut shaped piece in our brains that, it, it, you know, when, when, when crazy things happen and our brain kind of sends a message to the, uh, our, our, our senses send a message to our brains, it really goes first through the amygdala. Now, we've seen uh, examples of this, and you get a feeling for this when you see, uh, when you get pulled over by a cop. If you've ever been pulled over by a cop, what happens is your heart starts racing, your hands get sweaty, uh, maybe your heart sinks into your shoes a bit, and you feel like you're in lockdown. Your body feels tingly, maybe, and a few other things. There's physiological things that happen to you. Well, that's your amygdala kind of taking over. So that's really what happens. And what happens is it really kind of short circuits everything else. So here is an anatomy, a quick, quick, really, really easy to follow graphic here. On the left-hand side is normal functioning uh, of a human being. And what's known as the higher cortex really kind of handles most of our functioning there. Now, the amygdala still gets information, right? But if we're having a low emotional response to things, uh, it doesn't take over. What happens when we have anger, fear, excitement, love, hate, disgust, frustration, really any range of emotions that are strong, what happens is it shuts down or, or bypasses our higher cortex functioning. So that's really what's going on in a nutshell here. Okay, so what I'd like you to do is quickly watch this five minute video if you haven't done so already. Um, featuring this this guy Joseph Ledoux and he's actually referenced in this article so watch that's five minutes plus but it's five minute down and dirty on how the amygdala does what it does okay so normal functioning we talked about that already the neocortex is really your regular thinking brain and it's the thing we use obviously from day to day when there's not a lot of emotion kind of impeding us uh, we decide things like what to have for dinner um, or making decisions about purchases like for example picking a ring out for your significant other uh, maybe balancing your checkbook or figuring out what you're going to say in traffic court so in other words it's not there's not a high degree of stress in the moment when you're thinking like that so that's the neocortex right and that's when we do when we normally function so what happens when we have a, an emotional response of some kind well the amygdala is, the amygdala is what gets triggered then like i said it's that walnut piece right here the amygdala is an information filter regulated by our emotional state. So when we're calm, the filter is wide open and information flows to the prefrontal cortex and we make good decisions, right? That's where we do the learning and the thinking. The prefrontal cortex controls our decision making, focuses our attention, and allows us to learn how to read, write, compute, analyze, predict, comprehend, and inter interpret. So how does the hijacking happen? That's what we're talking about in this article here, right? So really, a, the amygdala is the brain's hijacker. And what happens is that you, it, it short circuits or jumps past our critical thinking piece. The neocortex doesn't get a chance to weigh in, as it were. Um, this is really a, a, a survival mechanism that's born in us back when we were in caveman days, frankly, when a, a high percentage chance that we might get eaten by some other animal. So really, that's sort of hardwired in us, and it's something that's just been latent in us, and we all have it. So, But it's a survival mechanism that lets us react to things before the rational brain has time to mull things over. It is a form of intuition, frankly, where... Uh, again, we have this idea where, okay, I'm either going to, uh, I'm going to run or I'm going to fight. So like I said, it's faster than the thinking brain, right? Than the neocortex. And it's able to get to the rest of the brain first. And it's really a, a survival mechanism. Like I said, in, back in the day, we were hardwired to survive at any cost. And we had a lot of threats to our lives. Saber-toothed tigers, uh, even dinosaurs, as we now know. Uh, so all of that stuff uh, is related to that uh, that quick decision making that the amygdala provides. I have a chart on how that works here, right? Stimuli and sensory thalamus kind of goes right to the amygdala, and the amygdala right away uh, demands a response versus what's going on with our conscious mind or the neocortex. So it's known as the interrogator as well, and the article talks about this at some length. Really, kind of just says, "Is this you know quickly filters this information? Is this something I hate? Is this something I fear?" Is this something that hurts me? And if the answer is yes to any of those, obviously the amygdala gets activated. The other point I want to make on this slide here is it, is it, it has two sides to it, like, like uh, your kidneys and other things in the body. Um, there's two sides. There's a left amygdala and a right amygdala in what's known as the limbic system. Another interesting thing about the amygdala is really it's a storehouse of emotions. So 
anytime anything happens of an emotional quality, uh, the amygdala stores that. And then essentially anytime something similar happens, it triggers that similar response. So if you watch the video, you'll notice he talks about what's known as the Pavlovian response. And that's essentially where you tie certain stimuli to emotional qualities. And then you get a rea reaction so that, let's say, for example, Pavlov did that experience with dogs where he played, a, he, he uh, rang a bell uh, along with feeding them um, food. And when he played the bell or he rang the bell without feeding them food, it automatically caused a salivation to happen in the dog's mouths. And that's a good example of the amygdala and the limbic system and how that works. So that's really what happens. And that's really kind of a showcase for what it is, which is the storehouse of our emotions. So it's things, things like the creation of tears, when we should do that. Sad movies generally make me cry and uh, other things, right? Uh, and, and certain things. And that's what's stored in the amygdala. Also allows you to be comforted by touch and files emotional messages for later searching like an emotional museum of sorts. So it really is a sensory museum that's in your mind. So any smell, any sound, any taste, anything you saw in the past that triggers an re emotional response, anything you've touched, it really is just this museum of things in your mind. And it's a small little walnut, basically, in the middle of your brain. So a little bit more on this, the amygdala piece. It also talks about it being the psychological sentinel or a neural tripwire that elicits the fight or flight response. Again, uh, eat or be eaten, right, uh, is what that comes down to. Now, obviously, think about this, right? This day and age, we don't really need this as much anymore, right? And although we do have moments where we're threatened by things, ultimately, we're not, I mean, we're much safer than we ever have been. So it really seems a bit outdated. And obviously, we have these responses that we have to control. If we don't control them, we sometimes make snap decisions about stuff. And we'll talk about this more in this, in this section. But um, most often, things like this, this, this amygdala gets triggered uh, while we're at work. And it's not really necessary for us to, to have such drama around some of our decision making. So we we've got to do we got to train our brains basically to overcome that. Um, Dr. Antonio Dimasio, a neurologist at the University of Iowa College, has made careful studies about the amygdala and, and what happens when it's impaired, right? And so uh, basically, I've talked about this being an emotional storehouse, right? So what happens is you you lack emotion. I can't think of a fate worse than having a, a damaged amygdala. And a life without emotion, to me, seems a life not worth living in some cases. And that's really what happens. They have this flat affect and behavior that just uh, is really pretty sad to think about. So the key findings of this study by Dr. Yamasio, Damasio is that IQ is unaffected, but decision-making is severely flawed when the amygdala is, is, um, is damaged. Okay, so we know now what's going on there. Essentially, it's the flight or fight response and it's something that is hardwired on us from back long ago and we still have this today so what do we do how do we overcome that because these things can really short circuit your ability to manage affairs uh, in a decent way uh, can ha can uh, can't be good for your heart your brain your health or your job for that matter so here are some things i'd like to mention to you guys this is prescriptive uh, first and foremost just pay attention to your body right so i i noticed this one happens I'm, i've used the driving example before, but I usually get a little bit uh, heightened emotionally when I drive. Um, so I've got to watch that at every case. Uh, but pay attention to that, right? So if you notice that your heart rate's increased or uh, maybe your hands are a little sweaty um, or you're just feeling on edge, right? Notice that you're in the middle of a hijack and know that you can, you can change that trajectory. You can calm yourself down. Uh, you can use deep breathing to gain time and space. So we've always talked about uh, taking those deep breaths and taking a moment or taking a beat and stepping back from the emotion. This lets more oxygen to your brain and lets the rational brain begin to work, um, which is otherwise paralyzed. Uh, you can use a mantra or self-talk like, I'm okay, this isn't a real threat. Give me a second to come out of it. And I've used this actually to, su to some success. Just it seems horrible in the moment because that's your amygdala hijacking everything else. So take a step back from that, and actually, after a few minutes, you'll probably realize it's not as bad as it first seemed. Uh, ask for a few minutes. Take a break if you have to. Let me get back to you on this, right? So don't bang off an email right away because you're just mad. Uh, or, or worse, say something in a meeting or say something to somebody you might later regret. Just, you know, find a way. Remember those hip pocket phrases we talked about? You feel yourself all charged up. Pull out the old, let me get back to you on this quote. 
Last thing I want to mention, hijacks can last a few seconds or a few minutes, but the sooner you break its spell, the better you'll feel. You'll learn you can keep in control without losing face. So again, these are some tips here on managing your amygdala. Here are the top five amygdala triggers in the workplace, which is where often we spend our time, and really, frankly, where you have interactions with people that cause the amygdala to fire off uh, at, at will. So condescension, lack of respect. Now, I've, I've experienced this. I'm sure a lot of us here in this class have also experienced condescension or a lack of respect for what we do. And that, can, for a lot of people, can fire off the amygdala and create situations where you might say things you regret. Of course, being treated unfairly, and I've had many positions where I've been treated unfairly as well, where you just tend to stew on that a little bit. And then, of course, at points when it happens, and it happens in the moment, you, uh, you might have that flight or fight response uh, from the amygdala. Being unappreciated, of course, also kind of ties in with that. And feeling you're not being listened to or heard. And, of course, the other one here is just time, temporal. Uh, having unrealistic deadlines, which I've also experienced quite a bit of, where you are asked to burn the midnight oil constantly. Um, and over time, that can wear you down and create a situation where you might say something you regret. Okay, so what's the challenge for us, then? is this idea of harmonizing emotion and thought. So we have the amygdala, right? And it's this antiquated almost sort of response. Now, it still does save us, so I'm not going to say it's completely useless. Uh, but I will say uh, it, it's something we got to be mindful of and we got to manage. So toward that end, we have to strive to tie together our emotions and our thoughts better. So this traditional tension between reason and feeling. Feeling should take a backseat is, 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 uh, to reason is flawed. Now, I've worked in companies where uh, it's not permissible to cry at work or to show emotion of any kind. Um, so I would suggest to you that the, bigger, the newer companies, the more progressive companies, uh, really focus on what's called em emotional intelligence more. So this idea of the old paradigm, which held an idea of reason free from the pull of emotion, the new up paradigm that companies are now adopting more and more urges us to harmonize the head and the heart. There's a great band called The Head and the Heart, by the way, which I recommend, but uh, kind of getting toward that end. But strike an intelligent balance between both reasoning and feeling. So what I call that, and what's referred to, obviously, is emotional intelligence, which I think is critically important. So I mentioned, obviously, EQ versus IQ. Now, obviously, being smart enough to do the job is important, but... A lot of companies these days are now looking for your EQ or how well you handle your emotions within the context of a workplace. So here's some of the things that are important, in order of importance employers say it, that are important and all of which are involved with emotional intelligence. The first, of course, is how, well, how calm do you remain under pressure? And that's like directly related to your emotional intelligence. And if we always kind of fly off the handle because uh, we get charged up quickly and our amygdala is not being handled appropriately, that's a really good example of, of not managing your time uh, under pressure. Number two, resolve conflict effectively, right? So we talk about that in this class quite a bit. Number three, the most important thing is uh, are empath empathetic to their colleagues and act as such. So in other words, have empathy for others. Again, an emotional intelligence qu uh, quality. Number four, lead by example. Again, showing how to do things in a positive way. And then finally, uh, you, uh, you may put more consideration into business decisions. So all of these things kind of roll up into uh, EQ versus IQ. So EQ versus IQ. EQ really can be described as motivational and reflective and self-aware. Um, good at managing relationships with other people and... Um, Organizational dynamics are, are at play there as well. And when you have high EQ, you really are socially aware of what's going on. And you do care about other people and what they're, what they're going through. Conversely, IQ, which a lot of companies today still actually hire just on IQ. And they don't even care about EQ. Uh, in some cases, maybe that's okay. But I would say in a lot of cases, particularly if you're working for a company where you have to do a lot of interaction with others or even the public, uh, you know, EQ is, is vitally important. So, but IQ is technical know-how and things, as of course we know, you know, just the smarts. So, okay, so I, I'm asking you to take this quick 10 question questionnaire. Now, obviously no way is that uh, definitive about your own emotional intelligence. So don't, don't dig too deep into that unless you want to take the longer test, which I encourage you to do if you have the time. But this abridged version will give you a quick snapshot of that, right? So let's say your EQ or, uh, or I, EI, uh, rather, your emotional intelligence score is low, right? Which can happen. And don't be surprised by that. If that's the case, if you have never thought about this before, it's a big thing. 
So I'm going to give you some tips on how to improve that because the great thing about emotional intelligence, as I have mentioned, is that it can be improved. The minute you think about it and start thinking about how I improve that is the minute you'll start growing your emotional intelligence. And it's something you can actually build up like a muscle. Um, so first thing you do is be mindful of nonverbal communication. So watching facial expressions and movements, body language and gestures. Now I'm a communication kind of aficionado, so I always uh, notice body language on top of what's being said. Uh, so we should do that as well. So get really good at reading those nonverbals. Uh, of course, reducing stress generally. Now, I, I tend to be stressed out sometimes, and I have to kind of chillax. Now, music is one thing I use quite a bit, and obviously I have a dog. My dog is uh, is everything to me, and he's kind of talked me off the ledge without, you know, in dog language, of course, but he's he's helped me a lot of times too. So find your, your stress ball, as it were, the thing that kind of helps you kind of reduce stress. And that will obviously put the amygdala in check. Um, stay connected to your emotions. Always be understanding of kind of when you are having uh, an episode of some kind or when emotion you know is impacting you. Just be, be aware of what's going on, I, I guess, basically there. Um, you can also practice effective conflict resolution. Now, in, in this class, you'll have, and obviously our paper for this week is all about what, what have you learned so far, but the things you've learned you should try to employ in your day-to-day -day life. So choose your words carefully. Think things through before you say them. Take a beat, like I've said. Keep the conversation centered on the present as much as possible. So you don't want to stray off and talk about the past or